Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Improving Targeted Methylation Sequencing. My name is Pupak Farahani, Marketing Manager at Twist Bioscience, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we get started, um, I'd like to remind everyone on a few housekeeping items. All lines uh, will be muted during the webinar. Uh, we will answer all the questions after the end of um, all the presentations. And if you have any questions, uh, please submit them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box, because we'll go through them on the Q&A box. And um, uh, following the presentation, if you have one minute to take a brief survey, we would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, so then uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Brian Hoagland, Senior Manager and GS Business Development. Uh, Brian earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Cell and Molecular Biology from University of California, Santa Barbara. He spent the next 16 years at Roche working as a research scientist on in vitro diagnostic assays, lab developed tests, NNGS and oncology, transplantation, diagnostics, infectious disease, and companion diagnostics. In 2017, he transitioned to the role of field application scientist with the Roche and GS team, and then later that year, brought those skills to Twist. As a Twist field application scientist, he supported customers working with Twist's portfolio of products for NGS. He now holds the role of senior manager in NGS Business Solutions, where he combines his expertise in the field of NGS with his passion for helping customers develop novel, useful, cutting-edge products that accelerate today's NGS-based research. So uh, thank you. My name is Brian Hoagland. I am the senior business manager in the NGS Business Solutions. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the TWIST targeted methylation sequencing. So a little bit about TWIST, uh, we're a synthetic biology company that was founded in 2013. We're headquartered in South San Francisco. Uh, since then, we've been expanding out to multiple cities throughout the world, uh, based in San Diego, Tel Aviv, Singapore, and in Guangzhou. And we host a large, div diverse uh, product line of synthetic biology and also moving into antibody discovery. For today, we'll be discussing our NGS tools and applications. So what we focus on very significantly here at Twist is, is three key things when we build out all of our tools. The very first is maximized efficiency. This is maximized efficiency in hybridization capture for extreme performance. The next is greater flexibility. Greater flexibility in panel design and workflow utility and taking that panel design and create faster panel optimization to help you develop a um, very specific assay that will answer all the questions needed. So for maximized efficiency, the cartoon below illustrates our main point. The whole goal is essentially to get the most amount of information with the least amount of sequencing. So this represents a base call pileup where the dotted line represents the sequencing threshold required um, to answer your question. So everything in the shaded area is actual useful data across the spanning all of your targets. Anything that is above that dotted line is over sequencing and essentially using redundant molecules and wasting real estate on the flow cell. Anything that is under sequenced and does not meet your sequencing threshold requirement has a reduced um, variant call confidence and thus would have to be discarded for analysis, potentially repeated and sequenced to the appropriate depth. And then there's off target. So off target specificity of binding the probe where you want it to go. Off target analysis is basically additional um, underutilized data and thrown out. So providing the flexibility you need in the workflow above on the top where the chevrons are is the central dogma of sequencing. So first you start with your sample preparation, your nucleic acid extraction, and then you move into twist core capabilities, the library prep and target enrichment reagents, followed by sequencing and tertiary analytics. So what we do is we create a, a wide variety of reagents to basically use those tools in combinations to suit any application need. And lastly, fast panel optimization. So we have our, our panels for exceptional performance through 
their unparalleled uniform capture. For methylation, we've focused on sensitivity of the methylation fraction detection and rapid panel design iteration, design flexibility, and these panels are compatible with both cell-free DNA and FFP inputs as well for those challenging samples. The panels that we create are very diverse in its content capabilities and panel sizes. So starting to take a look at the targeted methylation sequencing workflow, I'd like to break down a few kind of key things. Um, the very first thing you would start is with the panel design. The panel design, you would submit a bed file to our design team where they would use our tertiary or our design algorithm to basically create a panel for you. Then it would move in to the top line where the first step is a library construction process followed by a methylation conversion event and PCR amplification. Then there is a targeted methylation hybridization capture followed by another PCR amplification. We call this pre-capture conversion. The reason why we set up this workflow is because we wanted to focus on the greatest library complexity possible and full saturation of capture in your targeted molecules. If you can create a very strong library complexity, you can actually then move into additional applications that require lower DNA input. Applications such as early detection screening, liquid biopsy then become a reality um, for the workflow. Now, this has uh, extreme performance advantages, but one of the things um, previous, previous uh, vendors have created the bottom workflow where you have a library construction, a targeted enrichment, and then a methylation conversion event. So this does have an advantage in the sense that the post-capture conversion is not is, does not convert um, the sequence motif, so you can actually just design probes that are reverse complement to the native um, DNA sequence. But what this does do is it creates a massive bottleneck in this, in this step, and that reduces that library complexity, and that complexity is where we achieve sensitivity. So we identified this problem, and then we wanted to build out a design algorithm process that would handle a pre-capture conversion. So we took it through a machine building and learning cycle where you design, build, test, and learn from it. So everything that we learn are the thermodynamics of the binding, the GC content of the probes, and how they actually hybridize. We take in repetitive elements into that nature, and we do then boost balancing on all bases to get the most uniform capture possible. The next thing that we had to do is we wanted to see um, the ability to maximize the sensitivity. So what um, a, a traditional conversion event looks like is all unmethylated cytosines are deaminated and converted to uracil. Then through PCR, they are amplified with a thiamine or an adenine. So in the end, what that creates is actually eight additional species of probes. If it is unmethylated, uh, the, the um, <clears throat> cytosine is blocked and protected, and it is thus not converted. So with all of these, that creates eight, eight specific probes. So with the power of our platform and the ability to synthesize millions of oligos of DNA, we actually synthesize eight individual strands of DNA probes that are reverse complement to that. The next is the workflow. We wanted to create an end-to-end -end workflow for the methylation uh, for the methylation application. So first we started with library preparation. So in, in, the, in the early days of scouting out, there were a lot of new technologies out there uh, for this, but what we were able to do is partner with NEB and bring their brand new EMC kit onto our shelves as a co-branded box uh, for the library construction and conversion event. This library prep is different than, than the predecessors because it follows an enzymatic conversion. Next, moving into the targeted enrichment, there are a few kind of key properties that we wanted to do. We wanted to optimize the stringency workflow and the hybridization capture we also built out a methylation enhancer 
that increases the specificity of your targets. And then of course, the utility for custom panels, twist custom panels for all of your target targeted needs. So the NEB EMC kit follows an enzymatic approach. So what it does is first, it will be able to bind the hydroxymethyl and methyl groups utilizing a TET2 enzyme. This is then denatured and then the ApoBec enzyme comes in and deaminates the cytosine. So using an enzymatic process has a lot of distinct advantages. The first thing that we wanted to do in looking at the yield um, to, to evaluate the kit is we had to look at the conversion rate. So we wanted to look at all of the unmethylated cytosines and how those are actually converted and make sure they compare against the longstanding gold standard of bisulfite conversion. So we set a threshold of about 99.5% of all unmethylated cytosines must be converted. And when we look at the enzymatic versus the gold standard approach, we did see that the enzymatic method was at least as good or just a fraction better, thus doing that the enzymatic approach is, is very successful in doing what it's supposed to do in converting. But there's a key benefit in using the enzymatic approach. Bisulfite conversion tends to degrade DNA, sometimes up, up as much as 90%. So this degradation is very problematic for assays that are using low amounts of starting material, such as cell-free DNA. So one of the, one of the um, signs that we can see about this degradation is running a PCR. So with all variables set, when you use a, a commercialized bisulfite uh, conversion kit, um, it degrades the molecules. Then in PCR, as you amplify up there, the end result will be a reduced mass. You simply don't have enough molecules in the system to start the amplification. So you do not generate the yield at the very end. So it's approximately under 10 nanograms with a kind of standard bisulfite kit. Now, right out of the box, the enzymatic method has no degradation, maintains the unique molecules in the system, and through amplification, you have 100, over 100, 112 nanograms per microliter of total material. The two in the middle are extreme modified versions of uh, the bisulfite conversion. So this is to represent that if you do have expanded protocols, you can increase that yield, but some of the conversion events do suffer from that. The next step in uh, the enzymatic approach, uh, one of the main values is when you're looking at cell-free DNA and liquid biopsies. So on the, on the right, you have a graph that has its very traditional three peak traces of what cell-free DNA looks like on, on, a, on a tape station. This is due to the first, second, and third histone turns and breakpoints that occur for the cell-free DNA. So we refer to this as higher molecular weight what we've seen is that in the bisulfite conversion method, this high molecular weight is erased, essentially erased. And we want to maintain those second and third histone breakpoints as they are unique molecules and useful in, in the uh, methylation detection. So now we want to take the kind of end-to-end -end approach, and now we want to look at the sensitivity. So early on, this was one of our first experiments where we took two cell lines, um, one that is less than 5% and one that is close to 100%. And we did contrive cell line mixtures. Um, we emulated what a methylation sample would look like at 25, 50, and 75%. We ran a panel hybridization capture on that, and we looked at it through the uh, secondary analytics. So in this IGV trace for qualitative purposes to show when you have a specific marker we pulled out, this, this marker is involved in breast cancer, and when we pulled this out, we can clearly see qualitatively that um, the samples that have 25, 50, 75, and 100 percent actually really do emulate that as well. The quantitative data is, is behind this as well. So the, uh, the enzymatic method, when introduced with hybridization capture, does have another advantage where the the enzymatic method has less bias in the high GC targeted regions. So on the, on the uh, y-axis here is the, is the uh, depth of coverage. 
On the x-axis is all of the probes across the entire GC spectrum. And with the enzymatic approach, you have a nice bullet hole of uniformity where every molecule is more or less represented um, equally. With the bisulfite method, you can clearly see a skew. And as this skews down, over in the, uh, the top right area, you do not have those high GC content molecules. So to show this graphically in another way, are the, are the two graphs to the right of that, where you have the GC content on the, on the x-axis and the read count on the y. And you can see that in green, the enzymatic approach maintains those molecules at that high end, where you definitely see a large tail off of bisulfite. Okay, so to put this to test, um, one of our very early and first um, collaborators was working on a panzer for early detection cancer screening. And uh, they were already pretty far in the process with um, um, another vendor. And they've gone on three to four to five different panel iterations. So we designed this panel, they tested it, and kind of right out of the box, looking at some key metrics, we got a 3x fold enrichment increase. So we're saturating out more unique molecules and enriching it from the background of the genome. The uniformity in this metric is fold 80 base penalty, lower is better, one is perfect, and ours is 1.65 compared to almost four. So what you can think of that is that's a way to calculate the delta between the peaks and valleys. The lower the number, the lower the delta. So in those high, high sequenced and under sequenced um, targets, we have more uniformity on that. Two different metrics for specificity on target and off bait. On the on target, uh, we perform better than, uh, than, than the competition. And then the off bait, you want an actual lower number and we've, we have a better uh, on target than that. So what do all these kind of performance metrics mean to, for the application? So really what this investigator was doing is trying to draw a clear line between tumor versus nor normal samples. So they selected biomarkers for their DMRs and you can see clearly that in this uh, sample cohort of cancer versus controls, you can definitely see the, the elevated hypermethylated regions associated with that, with that cancer cell compared to the baseline normal. So in essence, that is a, a great clinical proof of concept that this uh, kind of end-to-end -end solution works and works very well. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the human methylome. So um, in, in May, we have launched the TWIST human methylome. And what this panel is, it is a very large screening panel for discovery purposes. So we definitely found a utility. Many questions that were asked was um, they are still in the process of determining their DMRs or their methylation biomarkers. And so they needed to um, basically run many, many samples to then select those biomarkers and create a more focused targeted panel for their either their assay or their specific study. So what we did is we, we procured a content set that we hope to appease most people, everyone. Um, we, we selected 3.98 million CPG sites out of the 30 million there. That was based on um, trying to get the most amount of informative CPG um, markers but trying to make it to a panel where it is um, uh, can be used for a high throughput methodology for larger sample cohorts. So the panel size is 123 megabases. Um, it's based and um, designed off all of the recent databases. The best way for us to show this to you is to request an annotated bed file where you can look through those markers to select and make sure that everything is, uh, the content is there that you need, and then run this through. So one of the things with uh, 123 megabase, um, the performance had to be absolute key. So we spent a lot of time um, optimizing this for absolute maximized efficiency to reduce that sequencing footprint and make it actual cost effective and economical. Okay, so one of the questions that we do get is um, what, what is the comparison of um, uh, current technology that's out there? So the Epic Array 850K chip. 
So what this shows is that we have approximately 94.9% coverage of the EPIC array. The Venn diagram here shows the overlap where the twist methylome has 3.1 million additional CPG sites and the EPIC array has 44 sites that we kind of determined um, not as useful. So there's some very key benefits. So now looking at um, two different types of technology, NGS versus microarrays, and really what is the best type of technology to use for methylation fraction determination? So there's a few key points here to kind of discuss. The first is NGS has an increased dynamic range of methylation fraction detection. So what that refers to is that um, arrays are very known to have um, background noise at the low end of uh, the spectrum of the fraction detection, and then signal saturation at the high end. So in doing that, essentially, you're kind of narrowing your lens and focus on the actual fraction detection, where NGS is able to do that in kind of a different, more quantitative manner. So. NGS has single base resolution across the entire, entire sequence to read. This will allow for additional kind of context um, out, of that, out of that content to see if other um, CPGs in the, in the island or in that region are methylated. The fact that we can actually um, first capture the sense and anti-sense strand and hybridize that and then sequence the sense and anti-sense strand that actually increases that detection complexity. And then through this process, you can actually do SNP analysis through that, which is a major advantage of NGS. Um, the way you're able to do that is essentially look at the opposite strand to see if it is a methylation event or a, uh, uh, an actual SNP. So then you have the ability to increase the sequencing coverage depth to further quantify that methylation fraction. So sequencing depth is, is really in, in the eye of the application, and uh, that is defined by the question that you want to answer. But with NGS, you're allowed to do that. Arrays are a little more um, static, where they essentially take the fluorescence values of the green and red, subtract the two, and infer that methylation pattern. But this one is very highly quantitated. Okay, so I will skip the rest on this for time. This is a, an example of this um, increased dynamic range. So in green is the twist human methylome on sequence on NGS, and in the orange is the epic array. So what we have here is at this end, we have a, a greater density of base calls of, of CPGs called with a zero coverage and then here from 90 to 100, we have a pretty big increase. So we know limitations of the, of the microarray technology in this application. So what this does is this actually pulls the global methylation percentage. It actually shifts that over up to five to even 7% um, of that through kind of taking a more narrow lens through the fraction detection. So I'd like to kind of zoom in on this a little bit. So we pulled out one KB of, of CPG sites and looked at the detections over the two different technologies. So zooming in here is about 200 sites. Uh, in, on top, in the, in the green, is twist methylation with uh, NGS. And you can see that the array kind of has a, a rain that comes down. So it is not as sensitive in that high high tip top spectrum. Um, you can really lose like about a 10% delta uh, on the high end. And then really it's about a 5% delta with the background noise associated at the low end. So this is important for uh, human development where you're looking at methylation markers that are fully turned on or off. This just gives a more razor uh, sharp picture of, of what's going on biologically. So now what we wanted to do is we wanted to pull out a, a specific marker site. So in, uh, in the BRAC1 promoter region, um, we wanted to take a look at the specific markers and just get, a, get a, an idea of what uh, the calls are between the two systems. So in blue are the markers, in green are the twist targeted uh, methylation markers, and then the epic array markers on the bottom in orange. And so what we have here is generally we have about a zero to one to even maybe 2% of that 
where the background fuzziness of, of rays kind of call it to around the two, three, four, five percent. But then we arrived at this marker. Now, this is a significant delta, and that was of pretty high interest. So the first thing we wanted to examine is, is um, the NGS method called zero um, percent methylation fraction here, where it was about 18.5 on the array. So uh, my, my first inclination was that this could, is this a, a dropout? Um, is, do we have a zero coverage event at, at this? Well, the good thing with NGS data is you can go back and you can take a look at it. So in going back and looking, we have 100 and we actually had 145 X mean coverage. And with that 145 X mean coverage, that actually gave us a lot of confidence. We had 145 actual unique molecules that tell us that there was not a conversion event. And not only that, it was the sense and the anti sense of that. So then what's going on? Well, at this very specific site, that is a known variant. So this known variant can be actually um, causing issues. So the fact that this known variant is a C to T mutation, that is what emulates a methylation conversion event. And so we do feel that this is an actual variant that has been called. And with the inability of um, double-stranded sense and anti-sense capture and sequencing, um, you wouldn't have that ability to look at the reverse strand to see, in fact, what, what is being called. So the tertiary analytics removed this from analysis where uh, the array had to call that at an, at an elevated 18.5%. Uh, okay, so in summary, we've created a targeted methylation sequencing. So it is a complete end-to-end -end workflow. It's usable on gDNA, FFPE, cell-free DNA inputs. It's, we have highly optimized panel designs with exceptional performance across a wide range of applications and panel content. And we have now launched the TWIST human methylome panel for methylation biomarker discovery and screening for determination of, of those biomarkers. So thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it. Uh, now I would like to turn it over to John Schultz and um, I will hopefully see you back in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, um, for that great presentation. Uh, a reminder that if you have any questions for, for Brian, please add them in the Q&A box, and we'll go through them after the next uh, presentation. Next, I'm thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Jonathan Schultz, Manager, Clinical NGS Services at Sampled. Jonathan earned his PhD in biology at the University of New Mexico, where he studied evolutionary and comparative immunology. It was during this time that he learned the utility of next-gen sequencing data and associated bioinformatic tools to answer questions involved in molecular interplay between host and parasite. Jonathan continued his work as a postdoctoral scholar using um, NGS data to investigate the evolution of an NK cell-like recognition system in an invertebrate uh, chordate at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Jonathan joined Team Sampled um, during the height of pandemic to assist with COVID sample processing and testing. He now uses his expertise in the next-gen sequencing as a manager of clinical NGS services at Sampled. Dr. Schultz, turning over to you. Thanks, Pupak. And uh, thank you all for attending. I'd like to um, thank uh, the TWIST team, Brian, Amanda, Pupak, and others for inviting me to <clears throat> give this talk. Um, and, uh, you know, our focus is more on the, the user end side of things. So I think it, it'll complement nicely with what Brian has already uh, presented in terms of their chemistry and performance. So as you can see on the slide, I work for uh, Sampled. Um, we are the artist or lab formerly known as uh, RUCDR Infinite Biologics and also formerly known as Infinity Biologics. So uh, we, we started initially um, uh, uh, as part of uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey and have since spun off into our own uh, company. Um, so you may or may not have heard of us with those other names, um, but uh, uh, here we are now known as Sample. And so I'm here to talk about what uh, methylation sequencing looks like in a smart lab. And as uh, Pupak mentioned, I, I am currently the manager of our clinical NGS services, um, but I overlap greatly with, with all aspects of, of NGS at uh, Sample. 
So I'd like to start off um, talking about uh, who we serve as a company in case you're interested or know others in need of a service provider. Um, so we serve a diverse uh, clientele um, from biopharma uh, to even uh, digital health uh, companies. And um, some of our largest contracts actually have uh, come from our, our academic and, and government background. So for instance, we, we perform uh, NGS sequencing for uh, the National Institutes of uh, Drug Addiction or Drug Abuse through NIH. Um, and we also are proud to also uh, perform sequencing work for the Million Veterans Program through the, the VA. Um, but uh, we serve all, all sorts of clients, whether big or small, um, from startup companies trying to develop their health product um, and get, uh, get their uh, uh, companies up and running, uh, as well to more established companies that have been in the game for a while and are looking for a new service provider or some other uh, offerings that we might have at uh, Sample. Our name uh, is indicative of our focus. Um, and so at Sampled Smart Labs, uh, we are designed for quality, speed, and scale uh, to make it faster and more efficient to conduct research or launch a health product. And by the name Sampled, we, we refer to you, of course, as the, the, uh, um, uh, the client, but also the sample. And we are all about the sample um, and how a sample goes through our process at, at Sampled Smart Labs. So when we consider some of these aspects um, like storing, uh, we have considerable biobanking capabilities. I think for a while we were one of the largest academically based biobanks um, in the country, if not the globe. Um, we have ICH stability storage, uh, a dedicated team uh, working uh, to help clients uh, retrieve samples. So we have samples for offer um, if they're publicly available. Uh, as well as some of the data associated with those. Um, and of course, we, we have considerable sample data storage and an informatics team. We also manage your sample, uh, whether it's from study management. So we have dedicated sample management and study management teams to help you, um, again, either launch a uh, health product or perform whatever research uh, you need uh, as a company. We do a considerable amount of bioprocessing and DNA and RNA extraction. Uh, having our own dedicated teams uh, perform uh, uh, these uh, functions as well. And again, as mentioned, sample data management and informatics. For the analyzed portion of our company, this is this is more where uh, I, I step in uh, and take part of. Um, but we have a diverse uh, sort of analytics offering at Sample. Uh, we have microarray and Infinium teams, uh, NGS teams, uh, QPCR, uh, ELISA, histology, cellular services, you name it. Um, we, we are well equipped at Sampled Smart Labs. And today, obviously, we're focusing more on the epigenomic side of things as it relates to NGS and the TWIST methylation detection system. We also have a, uh, a well-established cellular services team. This is where a lot of kind of stem cell research takes place, uh, including developing cell lines and uh, edited cell lines that we maintain for years for, for client use. And uh, um, I would say among all of our services as a company, uh, these are all client specific, uh, customized, and we work really closely uh, with our clients. And lastly, I don't want to forget about uh, some of the more logistics side of things. We, ha we have our own kitting and sample collection team. So we can provide clients with um, uh, kits to collect samples if they if they need that sort of infrastructure. Infrastructure, and we have a well-developed supply chain to send and receive samples um, in appropriate uh, conditions and uh, regulatory aspects. Part of our goal and vision as a company, um, since uh, spinning off from Rutgers and uh, expanding, uh, which we're definitely in the growth and expansion part of our our company. Um, is to consider a number of different elements, whether it be genetic health, the interplay of genes and choices and environment, um, anal analysis focused on reproductive health, like NITP, NIPT screening or carrier screening, among others. Uh, oncology as a whole, uh, and I can speak on behalf, you know, NGS, we offer, uh, uh, we have an established hereditary cancer assay, and we're, we're looking to add more to our portfolio. Um, for whatever our clients needs. Uh, as I mentioned, our cellular services, uh, they develop IPS cell lines or um, applications that can target a number of different um, uh, categories when, when, it, uh, when considering precision medicine. 
And of course, uh, this is really my job here at Sampled um, is to help uh, develop and maintain our molecular diagnostics capabilities, especially as it pertains to NGS. Part of our strategy includes our overall omics strategy. And so what you'll see here is a, a pie chart or a pie graph of, of the different omics we might uh, provide or offer. Um, and of course, today we're focusing on uh, more of the epigenomic side of things here at Sampled, uh, which would include uh, DNA methylation, chip seq, uh, genomic sequencing, exome, and RNA sequencing as well. Um, I'm not going to touch on these other things, but of course, uh, we, ha we have other capabilities in other omics areas uh, here at Sample. So uh, as manager of the NGS uh, side of things, um, we have grown considerably since I've been here a little over two years in terms of our sequencing capacity and capability. Um, we offer standard Sanger sequencing um, using Seq Studios, and we're um, adding more high-throughput uh, uh, Sanger sequencing capabilities as well. And we have a plethora of Illumina short-read sequencers, uh, a couple of NovaSeqs, NextSeqs, and MySeqs, depending on the throughput or depth of uh, sequencing coverage needed for any given experiment or project. Um, you might consider targeted sequencing util utilizing smaller machinery and maybe whole genome, whole exome sequencing uh, using uh, like NovaSeq, uh, high throughput sequencing. And sort of the newest wave of addition to our sequencing portfolio is we've added two PacBio SQL 2Es for long read sequencing. Um, and although not uh, twist related, uh, but they also offer some interesting uh, methylation detection uh, capabilities now on their new platform. So kind of complementary to, to a short read and uh, targeted methyl seq that you'll hear a little bit more about. Um, before I jump right in here, I'll just say if, if you ever have any questions or feel free to reach out to us as a company if you know someone in need or you yourself are in need for any of our services. Um, and we'd be happy to uh, have uh, customized individualized talks um, uh, to talk about what your needs are and whether or not we can offer our services. Jumping into more of the um, functional side of things uh, at Sample, uh, we use high throughput uh, automated solutions. Um, and from an NGS perspective, we have uh, grown our portfolio of Perkin Elmer Cyclone G3 NGSX workstations. And so for all of our library preparations, uh, uh, we run them on our automated liquid handlers, including the twist methylation detection system. Uh, at Sampled, we have a considerable diversity of other liquid handlers, uh, Perkin Elmer Janus, uh, Beckman Coulter, Biomex, and uh, also Hamilton liquid handlers. Um, uh, but for NGS, we, we really rely heavily on uh, our NGSX workstations. So Brian uh, touched upon a little bit about the workflow of the, the twist uh, methylation detection system, but I want to spend a little bit of time how we run it in our lab, and it's probably transferable to other labs as well in using their chemistry. So there are a couple of key components of an NGS workflow. Um, we start with uh, shearing uh, the DNA. Um, and as Brian mentioned, this could also be used for cell-free DNA and FFPE samples. Uh, but for shearing using a methylation detection system, we rely on mechanical shearing using our Covaris LE220. LE and this is recommended because certain enzymatic fragmentation protocols or fragmentation enzymes might interfere with the downstream chemistry of this methylation detection system. So we do have to shear mechanically. Um, after shearing, we, we uh, QC our fragments, uh, make sure they're in the appropriate size range. Um, and all of our QC steps throughout this protocol rely on the uh, tape station 4200s, um, but any uh, standard uh, QC or fragment analyzer would, would be appropriate here. After uh, quality control and checking uh, our fragmented DNA, uh, we're then ready for our library preparation, again, on our Cyclone NGSX. I should say this is not uh, completely accurate. Um, when you're dealing with a targeted system, there, there are actually two library preparation uh, steps. So the first one is what we call our uh, pre-capture libraries. And Brian spoke of the benefit of a pre-capture conversion step versus the uh, conversion that happens post um, pre-cap libraries. Um, and so that's essentially like a WGS sort of workflow. Um, the second part of a targeted uh, uh, process is the post-capture library preparation. So this would involve um, taking your pre-cap libraries, um, 
quantifying them, QCing them, and then ultimately multiplexing them into uh, hybridization pools. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit when, we, when I present some of the data we have using this system. Of course, QC steps throughout that process, pre and post capture, and then we get ready for sequencing. Um, standard Illumina sequencing, QC checks, uh, denature and dilution of your libraries, um, and hopefully uh, to an end product uh, or deliverable to our clients. I, I didn't spend too much time, but also at Sample, we, we have our own bioinformatics group, which we can help uh, with uh, tertiary, secondary and tertiary analysis, um, or we deliver raw data uh, directly to our clients as needed. Preparing the uh, DNA methylation libraries using the TWIST methylation detection system, again, as I mentioned, uh, works on our cyclone liquid handlers. And I just wanted to show you kind of the interface um, of uh, the liquid handler with uh, essentially a recipe book. Uh, one of the things um, it's been really nice working with TWIST as a company is uh, their customer support is fantastic. and um, their automation team is also really great. And so um, we, we use a number of twist uh, protocols, of course, the methylation detection system, one of them. And what they'll do is um, get you set up and ready to go. Uh, so they'll help you install the program, come down, install it and water test it themselves um, if the need arises. And so the, the interface or the interaction between the, the cyclone itself and how you prepare your mixes comes in, in these sort of recipe style workbooks. And so I know it's a little small here. I'm not expecting you to read this, but you input number of samples that you're looking to run. Um, and this is all optimized to work on automation. So as you may or may not know, um, if a kit tells you it can run 96 samples, that's usually referring to manual, but uh, uh, Twist will provide some overage for reagents um, that it'll work uh, correctly on a liquid handler to account for some loss during preparation. So this has been a nice workflow and these are visually uh, appealing and, and they work really well uh, for our team. We currently don't have this portion automated, um, but you can also consider automating uh, your master mix setup uh, using a variety of liquid handlers, which is something we're, we're working towards to have a complete automated system from sample loading to, uh, uh, to library prep. All right, I think most interesting part uh, or the most informative part of my presentation is um, what does the data look like? So this is a, a small subset of samples uh, we've run, uh, but we have uh, other data um, if, if needed, or we can talk a little bit more about some of the sample types that we've run in-house. And I think uh, well, the first thing, this is a um, tape station uh, trace of our pre-capture libraries. And to me, what I think is most striking um, is uh, when you're looking at the electropherogram here is the, the uniformity and consistency of our uh, library sizes. Uh, this is indicative of all the twist chemistries that we've run in-house, not only their twist methylation detection system, but uh, their standard enzymatic frag library preps. We really get robust and consistent data um, looking you know, for size ranges between 300 to 400-ish um, uh, before uh, capture. And this is a representative peak trace. I think it's of sample A1, uh, a healthy distribution of uh, size ranges across, you know, this um, 300 to 500 base pair range. What you should take away from this is really good looking uh, pre-capture libraries. As I mentioned, in using a targeted system and something Brian focused on a little bit as well, we now have to take um, our pre-cap libraries and prepare them for binding with customized uh, probes designed by Twist. So for this particular client, they had their own customized panel designed, um, which we will then use. So we actually uh, QC and quantify our libraries uh, so that we can multiplex into our hybridization pools. And so our next slide here um, shows the results of a post-capture library process. As you can see, we now only have two pools or two traces here. Uh, and we've pooled eight samples per, per hive capture. And that's a pretty standard um, uh, workflow for twist chemistry. You can optimize um, and work with twist as well to um, uh, increase your multiplex capacity uh, if it's needed. We typically stick with eight just because of the results of the data, but I've 
multiplex 24, 16 samples together, 24 samples. And uh, um, I'm actually trying to, to go higher for some efficiency uh, purposes. So uh, there, there are a variety of ways to optimize this protocol. But what you'll see here again is really robust, fantastic looking post capture libraries. Again, in the 350 to 450 size range expected for this protocol. And so walking away from the system, we're always, uh, we're always impressed with how consistent our results look. And uh, the process itself is somewhat complex in terms of the chemistry involved and the, the hands-on time. You're looking at three to four days um, uh, using automation up to 96 samples. Um, but uh, having an automated system and a reliable uh, uh, product like this uh, makes the whole process a lot easier. Okay, but what does this data look like? So I have to thank our, our client um, for providing us with some of their sequencing uh, data since they are the ones that perform the analysis. And I, I'm not going to present all of the QC, QC metrics here, um, but I, I wanted to highlight uh, an interesting case uh, looking at fold 80 and AT dropout. So for these particular set of samples, when we first uh, ran the, the protocol and, and sequenced uh, uh, for our client, uh, the fold penalty was, was considerably high, around 16, um, and the AT dropout was around 30%. And so we were, we were a bit concerned, uh, but the only reason why I'm bringing that up is because uh, with a quick uh, consult with Twist and our client, all we had to do was uh, knock back our uh, hybridization wash buffer temperature um, and that improved things considerably. So it was, it was literally a click of the button on our, our cyclone to reduce the stringency of the wash temperature. And that got us into really healthy looking ranges for our QC. Um, and uh, we're consistently really happy with the results that we get. Uh, this was um, a targeted system. We've also run the whole methylone panel as Brian presented um, with, with similar results, of course, sequencing uh, depth uh, a higher sequencing depth is required for, for that sort of system, but uh, you can expect similar results using that panel or custom panels. And uh, before I wrap up, I want to leave some time for questions. Um, I had presented uh, a little over a year ago uh, to our, uh, internally uh, at Sample uh, some of the reasons why we we've chose to use the twist methylation detection system. Of course, knowing that uh, NEB co-brands uh, their EMC portion with, with twist. Um, and I stumbled upon this paper from 2021 that uh, evaluated whole genome DNA methylation sequencing using a variety of different library preparation protocols. And what uh, their, uh, the, the focus of their work was to look at a number of uh, uh, vendor offered uh, library preparation kits. So one of the things that separates uh, the TWIST or NEB kit, um, th this is an all inclusive kit. So the NEB kit, uh, along with the TWIST targeted system, is all inclusive, whereas the other, these other library prep kits rely on uh, a bisulfide conversion kit. So this is one of the most popular kits on the market. Um, and so I think that's one unique aspect. But in comparing these different vendor offered library prep kits, in addition to a PBAT protocol, which is kind of a wet, wet bench protocol, it's not, it's not a packaged kit here. Um, they look to compare uh, certain metrics across all these offerings. And what these authors ended up finding is that uh, the Nebnext uh, or Twist enzymatic methyl C kit performed better in almost every metric, uh, both with standard input amounts of 200 nanograms or those low in input amounts, which would be really useful for, again, as Brian mentioned, cell-free DNA and FFPE samples. Uh, what metrics do we consider? Of course, higher quality libraries, uh, larger insert size and higher library complexity. I think that was a big focus of Brian's data in terms of why we want to achieve higher library complexity while having at least comparable, if not more uniform distribution of reads across the genome. So good looking libraries, I think is the point here um, and better than, uh, if not the same, better than some of the other offerings. As it relates to methylation related metrics, uh, the NEB samples were among the highest in percentage of CPGs covered uh, with consistent cytosine retention across all reads. Again, these are their markers for methylation. So um, not retaining uh, uh, cytosine calls or correct methylated versus unmethylated would, would considerably impact your downstream analysis when you're looking to consider the, the whole methylome or a targeted methylome uh, sort of system. 
Um, so overall, uh, I, I forgot my summary slide here, but um, we have lots of success with the twist methylation detection system, great customer support, and uh, a really robust assay that um, uh, we offer our clients uh, in need of methylation sequencing. Uh, so with that and time running out, um, I'd like to thank you for listening. Please feel free to check us out online. And uh, I believe we are now up for our Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Scholz, for a very informed presentation. Um, we're now going to open it up to questions. If you have a question, please make sure to ask in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll start with some questions that came in during Brian's talk. I'll go, go uh, through them right now. So a question that was asked um, was that, um, could the um, approach be combined with uh, click chemistry uh, to protect um, hydroxymethylation, distinguish methylation from hydroxymethylation, the sequencing downstream, if prepared using your standard approach and separately using click chemistry. Essentially what we do is we do try to build flexibility in everything and there are specific applications where I, identifying hydroxy versus uh, normal methyl groups is, is very imperative, namely like placenta. Um, what I would suggest is to sync up with us offline on this where we can work with you for modified protocols. Um, that's something that myself and our FAS team can, can kind of help you out with. I've, I've technically worked on uh, two projects with other end users to kind of incorporate some of those types of chemistries in it. So let's let's have that conversation offline and see if we can help you answer that question. A uh, question that came in was that during the capture stage, are all methylated sites in the sample captured? The answer is yes. So our uh, conversion efficiency um, is 99 point something percent. Um, and uh, according, again, a lot of this is client-driven uh, feedback, um, but uh, in, in all cases, our, our clients are very happy with the capture efficiency um, and, the, and the overall coverage of uh, their targeted sites. I hope that answered your question. How about a sound check now? Oh, perfect. Sorry, there's a, uh, there, there's a problem with the platform. When you go on mute, you can't go off mute um, on this. So I apologize. So uh, yes, yeah, so let me speak to the click chemistry. So essentially what we do is we do try to build flexibility in everything. And there are specific applications where I identifying hydroxy versus uh, normal methyl groups is, is very imperative, namely like placenta. Um, what I would suggest is to sync up with us offline on this where we can work with you for modified protocols. Um, that's something that myself and our FAS team can, can kind of help you out with. I've, I've technically worked on uh, two projects with other end users to kind of incorporate some of those types of chemistries in it. So let's let's have that conversation offline and see if we can help you answer that question. Thank you. Next question um, for um, Brian. Uh, what's the on-target rate comparison of Hive comparison between BS converted libraries and NEB enzymatic converted libraries? Sure. So we do see a performance delta in this. Um, I do have a slide that I can I can forward you this, the exact slide that speaks to it. On average, uh, it's very panel dependent, but on average, you could see about a 10% delta of the bisulfite on target compared to the enzymatic. Thank you. Uh, next question is what about non-CPGs uh, in neurons? It's CPA also CPT? Sure, so, so CPH is, is definitely an application that I'm um, very interested in. Our, standard algorithm designs against CPGs. However, again, building flexibility to answer all your questions, our design team has the ability to, to shift the algorithm to design against CPH. So if you want neurodegenerative targets that, that follow that pattern, again, you can reach out to us and we can have a modification in our protocols and our design algorithm to make panels for against CPH. Thank you. Um, uh, could, could you discuss more the advantage of post-conversion capture versus pre-conversions? Sure, absolutely. So um, the, 
It's two methodologies to do it. Um, if you use a pre-capture conversion, that puts the burden on a design algorithm. So that was a development process that we that we had to undertake, but I felt it was imperative to bring that in because of kind of two key components. One, a post-capture conversion uses a lot of DNA input. Some of the protocols go from 250 nanograms up to a microgram. I've even seen protocols in the two micrograms. In my opinion, that really puts you out of what is very hot in the market right now of um, oncology. So if you're looking at FFPE, cell-free DNA, the advantage of using a workflow that still captures and saturates out all the molecules um, allows you to use a lot lower DNA input, and then that moves you into those very special and precious samples to use. But also, too, there is a major bottleneck. <clears throat> so in the, in the post-capture PCR, uh, I'm sorry, post-capture workflow, if you do that capture, um, you are capturing, and then you're doing a bisulfide targeting just that capture. So you strongly and heavily degrade um, like a very focused set of your molecules, and that has a lot of degradation. So what you can see is a reduced complexity of unique molecules and it's pretty significant. I've seen data sets as, as um, 2x to 4x more unique molecules captured with pre-capture conversion. Thank you. Um, one last question that we'll take. Um, this would be for, for Jonathan. Uh, what are some optimization steps you took to achieve high-quality uh, methyl seq libraries, and how is support from Twist in getting the assay up and running? It's a good question. Uh, I think I touched a little bit on already Twist support, both from uh, bringing the assay in-house, um, automation, and uh, um optimization of, of the library prep. Uh, I have a, f a few good examples of where, uh, you know, we, we did need to troubleshoot a few things early on in the process. And one of the things we were struggling with was um, overall conversion rate. And that it really had nothing to do with the twist chemistry, uh, but more with uh, the denature of our DNA uh, in the workflow. And it was simply a matter of the timing of when to go add our, uh, we use NaOH to denature. Um, the, uh, the libraries uh, throughout uh, the pre-capture process. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we had a number of, uh, um, I would say, training sessions or, or uh, uh, consults to, to figure out what was going on here. Um, and so once we got that squared away, it was, it was no problem. And another thing I mentioned is, uh, you know, when our client came back to us with, with some concerns about some QC, uh, fold 80 and AT dropout, again, a quick conversation um, what can be the root cause of it, uh, both on our end and maybe just the method itself? And it turns out temperature is, is, is something we can easily adjust to, to achieve optimal results. So um, Twist is great in doing that. And uh, in general, the, the, this essay is really robust. And outside of a few things, we, we haven't um, had any uh, major issues in running this uh, at sample. So. Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you. Well, thank you. I would like to um, just mention that we still have really great questions that uh, we will send um, the answers via email to you. Um, thank you to our, our presenters um, for your great presentations. Thanks, speakers. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, a quick reminder that following this webinar, you will be redir redirected to a brief survey. And if you have uh, one minute to spare, we would love to hear from you and get your feedback. Thanks, everyone, again, and have a great day. Goodbye.